to bring you greetings on behalf of the borough of Phoenixville. My name is Peter Urschler, and it is my great honor and privilege to serve as the mayor of this great community. Welcome to the historic Colonial Theater. As a community, Phoenixville is mindful that we owe our existence and vitality to generations of people from all abilities, geographies, and walks of life who've contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to shaping our shared home. The challenges faced by our community and communities across the country are vast, but we are fortunate to have an extraordinary advocate leading our sixth congressional district. An Air Force veteran, an engineer, a serial entrepreneur, an educator, a nonprofit leader, and now our Congresswoman. Please join me in welcoming Representative Chrissy Houlihan.
House of Representatives are now veterans, and 19 of us are first-time lawmakers, me included. And to that point, more than 20% of Congress is new to Washington, and that is actually really important for everybody to recognize. We have hundreds and hundreds of representatives in Washington, and 20% of us are new on both sides of the aisle. Our country has new representation as Democrats and as Republicans. And additionally, as new members, we have the dubious distinction of having been sworn into our new roles during the longest shutdown in United States history. So these are clearly challenging town, times, and there's no doubt about that. And the words of our country's oath are at the bedrock of every decision that I make in Washington, D.C. and here in Pennsylvania, to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, and that I will bear true faith and allegiance to our great nation. But long before January 3rd of 2019, and I, I made a promise. I promised to all of you, the people of this newly defined Congressional 6th District, that if I were elected, that I would be accountable and accessible to you, our community. So tonight, it's my honor to stand before you as our representative and to present you the state of the 6th. Here's the way that this is gonna go. I was in the military, I, was, I learned to present by tell them what you're gonna tell them, tell them, tell them what you told them. So this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna start with uh, a variety of local issues, things that are very hyper-local, and talk about our progress there at the national level. Then we're gonna go a little bit higher to the national level, all of the issues that we kind of consistently need to talk about regardless of where we physically live. And then we'll briefly touch on the future. And so hopefully you'll find this to be useful. This is our agenda, and we'll try as hard as we can to stick to it, but it is an experiment, and I'm, I'm confident that I will speak over time, but I'll try very hard to uh, respect your time. Let's go ahead and begin. Right, do we already have the norm slide? Did I miss that? Okay, really importantly, one of the things that I really tried to commit to uh, for our community is that we would reset decency and, and we demand you know, that this is a, a, a time where we need to agree to disagree. Sometimes we don't agree on issues, sometimes we disagree on policy, but we're all patriots. And we need to also be all respectful of each other. So I'm a former teacher as well, and if you're a teacher in a classroom, you set norms. And so these are some of the norms that at every town hall we ask of people. We may not agree, but we all can agree that we need to be civil and decent to one another and be respectful of one another. And so this is our norm slide. But let's go ahead. So the first thing that we, that we promised was that we would deliver transparency and accessibility. As we mentioned, we've had a town hall at least every month. We've had 14 town halls in 2019, including three telephone town halls for folks who aren't able to make it to a, to a community. The average Pennsylvania representative, the average Pennsylvania representative had four town halls in that time frame. So to put it another way, 25% of all of the town halls that happened in Pennsylvania happened here in the 6th Congressional District last year. <laughs> These gatherings are not only an opportunity for us to share updates from Washington, but also a chance to hear feedback and solicit ideas from this community. And one of this office's core functions is to help our constituents navigate the very complicated landscape of federal government and benefits, contracts, and permits, etc. Next slide, please. In continuing on the conversation of transparency and accessibility, not only have we had town halls all over the district, but we've also dedicated ourselves to accessibilities, both here, accessibility both here in the district and also down in Washington. We have 18 full-time members of our staff, and to give you an idea of the volume of the information that we're processing over that year, we've received 9,000 phone calls over that time, 73,000 emails, 3,500 letters, and we are committed to answering every single one of them. Next slide, please. Also here locally, we are committed to constituent services. As a reminder, constituent services at the federal level are Social Security, Veterans Affairs, the IRS, Immigration Issues, Medicare, Grants, Academy Nominations. Those are some of the things that your office, of, uh, your congressional office can help you with. And importantly to me, I'm, I'm an engineer and, so, and I'm a business person, and so I really wanna make sure that we're returning value to our community. We returned $1.8 million worth of value in all of those different areas over the course of the last year. And to give you some perspective, a congressional office costs the taxpayers about $1.3 million a year. So we returned a half a million dollars more than what we cost. And so for those of us who are doing the math, 
That's a 38% return on our investment to our community. And so I'm very, very happy to see that. Again, staying kind of local at this point in time, we're going to talk a little bit about what we've done specifically in our community to fight for jobs and opportunity. Uh, one good example is the Sikorsky factory. For those of you who were following, Sikorsky announced fairly uh, abruptly that they were going to leave Coatesville. About 500 jobs would be at stake. Uh, helicopters are made in that factory, important helicopters, including um, the helicopter that our president flies in. And this resulted in an immediate action, not only on the part of this office, but on the part of a lot of the other uh, local electeds, uh, statewide elections, and frankly, the administration itself also was very, very helpful in fighting to make sure that this didn't happen. So we did engage with the Sikorsky's leadership to make sure that they stayed. They did decide to stay. One of the other things that we were uh, effective in doing at a congressional level is putting in language and legislation that passed and that the president signed which effectively says to the Navy that until the Navy describes what will happen, what the impact will be of Sikorsky leaving this community to our national security, they cannot leave. So it's withholding funding from, from the Navy and, and from Sikorsky until such time as they've explained what the impact of national security will be. And that's a good thing for us. And importantly, we will continue to fight uh, for these jobs, and we will continue to work with whomever we can work with to make sure that these jobs stay, whether that's statewide, whether that's local, whether that's um, national, whether it's our senators, whether it's our president, we will continue to fight for those jobs. Another example was the USMCA, the Mexico-Canada Agreement, the new trade agreement, um, which we just enacted and was just signed by the president a few weeks ago. Canada and Mexico are the most important trading partners, full stop, for Pennsylvania. According to the USDA, 477,900 Pennsylvania jobs are supported by U.S. trade with Canada and Mexico. Canada and Mexico purchase two-fifths of Pennsylvania's total global manufacturing exports, which is about $15 billion in 2018. So importantly, um, I was an advocate of, of this deal, but also worked really hard through another organization that probably many of you have not heard of called the New Dems. And the New Dems is a new group of Democrats. It's 105 members of Congress strong. The Democratic New Dems caucus about the issues of pro-business and pro-opportunity. And we caucused uh, to make sure that the USMCA was the best deal we could possibly fight for. And so it did take a little bit longer, certainly, than many of us thought it would take. I started hearing about the possibility of USMCA passing in April, and of course we've only just passed it now. But I am very proud to have supported that agreement, and I do believe that we ended up with a much better deal as a result of spending more time and more deliberation. Uh, specifically a better deal for our dairy producers who rely on these markets that we're talking about, and for our manufacturers as well. So those are some of the things we've done locally uh, for our economy as well. We'll, sp we'll switch to the next slide. Speaking of agriculture and our economy, uh, another thing that we did locally speaking was about lanternflies. Um, I'm kind of a geek, yeah. <laughs> and I really like, they're, they're pretty insects, but they're very destructive. Uh, they're an incredibly invasive spe species from Asia, which is obviously affecting our agricultural community. It hurts tourism and revenues. Uh, and as a consequence of knowing that this was an issue, bipartisanly I worked with Representative G.T. Thompson to ask for uh, increased funding for, for USDA to increase funding for research and education efforts to make sure that we can uh, get rid of this scourge. And I think we've been actually making some progress as a result of the work that we've done. Uh, early in our tenure, we also heard from our communities about the challenge of retaining workers in the agriculture industry. Specifically, Chester County and Berks County have really fascinating agriculture that many people around the country don't have. It's year-round. It's mushroom and it's dairy. And so a lot of the conversations that we have at a national level about making sure that we have a good workforce for ag don't necessarily apply here in our community because of our year-round demand. And so because of this, we've been working, this office has been working very aggressively with the House Judiciary Committee, asking to make sure that whatever bill that they decide to come up with when it comes to workforce development for farming addresses this year-round issue in ag. And so as a result of these efforts, we just recently passed the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, which creates a pathway for legal status for farm workers and includes a special visa for year-round agriculture. And this bill passed the House with bipartisan support. Dozens of Republicans passed, uh, voted on this as well. And it now awaits action in the Senate. 
The House and Senate leaders on this issue are working very hard to see if there's space for compromise so that we can make progress on this very important issue. Now we're moving along to uh, what we've been doing for our veterans. I'm a veteran, my dad, my grandfather are vets, my brother is a vet, uh, my four active duty cousins right now. Only 1% of our population has served in the military, uh, but they have to be taken care of. We must take care of our vets. Of the 800 or so cases that we, that we fixed or helped fix in the last year, 207 of them were for veterans in our community. 25% of our casework involves veterans. Of the $1.8 million that we delivered back to our community, 730,000 of it was veteran related. So that's a pretty big deal. Uh, the other thing that I've been doing to help our local veterans is be a co-sponsor of bills. About 7,000 bills go through Congress every two years. Uh, I've been a co-sponsor of a couple hundred of those. About 10% of the bills that I'm a co-sponsor of relate to our veteran community. And my most, late, uh, my most recent thing that I sponsored about, I guess, a week ago was the Michael Lessig Military Firefighters Protection Act that I went on board with Representative Spanberger, who's a Democrat, and Representative Bacon, he's actually a general, former general, uh, who's a new, a new uh, Republican, and this bill will help veterans who were exposed to toxic fumes and smoke, and smoke during service as military firefighters to make sure that they get the benefits that they need and that they have earned. So that's what we've been doing locally for veterans, and I'll talk a little bit more about veterans when we get to the national level as well. Next slide. Local interest, uh, the opioid epidemic. Chester and Berks counties have suffered far too many deaths uh, due to this nationwide opioid epidemic that we have, and here's some data. In 2018, Pennsylvania had the third highest rate of drug overdose deaths in the country. Overdose deaths in Pennsylvania in 2013 to 2017 increased, but they have declined in 2017 to 2019. That doesn't matter when you're talking about Chester County reporting 89 overdose deaths in 2019 and Berks County reporting 68 overdose deaths in 2019. So what have we done about that so far? Uh, Attorney General Josh Shapiro and I convened a discussion amongst the front, those folks who are on the front line of this crisis. And we did this in the Reading area. And so I believe there's a picture of that here. Um, at this event, I was able to announce with Attorney General Shapiro that we are uh, putting forward two bills at the congressional level. One is House Resolution 3414, a bipartisan opioid workforce act of 2019. The bill creates 1,000 additional res residency positions over five years to hospitals with addiction, uh, medicine, addiction, addiction, psychiatry, or pain management programs. So this bill so far has been what's called reported out of committee, which basically means that we've taken the bill, we've sponsored the bill, it's been seen by its committee of jurisdiction, it's been voted out of committee, and now it waits on the floor for a vote from us at the House, and hopefully then we'll move on into the Senate. So that's where that bill currently stands. I hope that something will happen. The second bill that we put forward uh, at that time was H.R. 2466. It's the State Opioid Response Grant Authorization Act. This is also a bipartisan bill. It provides $5 billion in federal grants to states for response to the opioid epidemic. In 2018, Pennsylvania received $55 million from the federal government, and this bill will make sure that those grants remain available to states going forward. That still remains to be seen in committee, so that's an update there. Go ahead and move to the next slide. Now we're actually moving on to, from the hyper-local, you know, things that really matter to our community, uh, and then we're now moving to the national level. So all of the things that we'll be talking about now will, of course, have the lens of our community because we are here in our area, but they also are national issues. And the first national issue that we'll talk about is the number one, number two, and number three issue that I heard when I was running for Congress, and it still is the number one, number two, and number three issue that I hear from our community, which is health care. Um, and making sure that we're addressing these issues. So here, here's what we've got going on in healthcare. Um, we have not made as much progress as I would like to have made on this issue, but we have had the opportunity to pass a, a, a few bills out of the House of Representatives that talk about lowering the prescription drug prices, that talk about making sure that um, 
that we uh, limit the amount of out-of-pocket expenses that people have. Sadly, what I would say, and this is coming from me, I'm a Democrat, I believe that there's a lot of partisan politics going on on both sides of the aisle that disappoint me. And so one of the things that you're seeing here is a letter that I signed along with a lot of my colleagues, basically asking my leadership, asking the Congress to take bills in smaller bites and to say that it's not okay to put things together that have no, no chance of passing because they're too partisan, because they've been lumped together with things that Republicans won't like and Democrats won't like, but instead to try and have smaller bites of the apple to try and make a difference with with um, with prescription drugs. And <laughs> this bill recently, H.R. 3, and H.R. 3 is what I consider to be a pretty beautiful piece of legislation. It has some issues with it, and hopefully those issues will be resolved when the Senate takes a look at it or when the uh, President takes a look at it, because they also have similar bills uh, that they're looking at, both the administration and the Senate and we. And there are differences between the three of our bills, but this was also a bipartisan bill that came out um, of our side. And the President and the Senate and we have all said that this is the, you know, a really big issue that we want to make sure that we're taking care of. So I have some amount of hope that we will have make some progress. But the HR3 uh, is the bill that talks mostly, most uh, holistically, about this issue of drugs and drug pricing. And here are some of the things that it talks about. Uh, it makes lower drug prices available to all of the uh, Americans. It creates a $2,000 cap out of out-of-pocket expenses. It makes sure that we're pricing our drugs to 1.2, uh, uh, 120% of what other developed nations are paying. So right now, we as Americans kind of shoulder the burden of a lot of other nations. Uh, they pay a lot less for their prescription drugs than we do. It takes a lot of these drugs, a couple hundred of them, that uh, have really uh, suspiciously increased in pricing over the last couple of years and decades, and takes a look hard at them to make sure that they're not uh, gouging people. This is a good bill in a way. It's not a perfect bill, and hopefully it will end up um, being worked on by the Senate as well. And I'll continue to make sure that I'm, I'm riding this issue because it really couldn't be more important. Next slide, please. Climate change. It turns out it's real, and we're causing it. Um, <laughs> I think the one thing that I can say here, uh, there are several things that I'm trying to be supportive of here. One is a bill that is, um, 100% renewable energy by 2035. Another is a bill. <laughs> another is a bill that is about carbon credits and pricing, and uh, I think that's also an important step. Um, and I think what's really important, the last thing that I will say is, although we as a nation have left the, or will be leaving the Paris Climate Accord, another thing that we can do that I have been uh, helpful on and passed an amendment, and that is now also heading out off to the Senate is. We as a State Department, I'm on the Foreign Affairs uh, Committee, we as the State Department have leverage too. And so we can use the resources and, and power of the State Department to help other nations who are in the Paris Climate Accord to uphold their commitments. And we can help them understand what's available in, the in, the in our nation and across the globe that is working. And so an amendment was put forward and passed through the House um, that I asked for that talks about how we as a, as a nation can be helpful even if we as a nation are leaving the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, and of course I hope that that's not something that we end up doing. Um, next slide please. We're now moving on to firearms. Uh, in just the past six years, firearms have claimed the lives of 3,930 people in Pennsylvania. Uh, this was an issue that I also heard during the campaign. Uh, and I think if we have an opportunity here for the first time in 20 years, we've been able to pass some legislation through the House of Representatives. And now it sits waiting for the Senate to take it up. So I helped co-sponsor two different bills, both bipartisan, both talked about the importance of background checks. Uh, and that's really been something that is clearly important. I've seen some people in the audience who are focused on that particular issue. In our community, in addition to the legislation that we've supported in our community, we've tried to make sure we're advocating for this really important issue too. We've convened a gun violence roundtable with our, my good friend Michelle Roberson, who lost her daughter, sadly, to um, road rage gun violence. We also welcomed Team 26, which is a group of cyclists, and I think there's a picture of them here. Uh, they came from Newtown, uh, Connecticut, uh, on our road trip to try and elevate and uh, talk about the importance of gun safety. 
Uh, listen, 40% of us here in our community are gun owners. I'm a veteran. I understand and respect the Second Amendment. But I think about 80 or 90% of us, depending on the issue that we're talking about, believe that there are common sense things that we can do to be more safe in our communities, to be more safe in our schools. <laughs> Um, but we now are also talking at a higher level about um, jobs across our nation. We do have a, a good economy, a booming economy, and there are a lot of jobs out there, but there are also a lot of people who are left behind for a variety of different reasons. Uh, some of it has to do with the pay that they're receiving. And so some of the things that I've done in the last year is I was an original sponsor of the Paycheck Fairness Act. And hold, hold on here, this is something that basically says you get equal pay for equal work. Uh, and I think that that's really, really important to <laughs> Also in this, in this area, I reached across the aisle and across Congress, so bipartisanly and bicamerally, to advocate for legislation that allows people who are growing businesses in our community and, abroad, and uh, around our country to be able to elevate talented entrepreneurs who have terrific ideas and great ideas that they can't figure out how to fund and market. Uh, too many endeavors fail because they lack access to capital or they face intellectual property cha uh, protection challenges. And so some of the work that I've been doing is on a bill that's specifically about this issue, again, bipartisan, so it's, it, it's you know, both Democrats and Republicans, but here by Carol, so that there's a companion bill that's going on on the Senate side, so hopefully we'll have the opportunity to get this one through. And lastly, I helped pass the, Ra the Raise the Wage Act, uh, which will, over the next six years, raise the wage uh, to $15 an hour, which will give more than 33 million dollars Americans, uh, 33 million Americans and nearly 100,000 Pennsylvanians uh, in our community a raise. And for those of us who live here in Chester County and Berks County, we know that $15 is not necessarily even a living wage because it's a very, very expensive place to work. And so I'm hopeful that people will understand the importance of a living wage and, and, and treating people with decency. And the last thing, thank you. And the last thing that I'll talk about is union jobs. Uh, a lot of our union workers who are retired are at risk of losing their pensions for a variety of different reasons. There's a Butch Lewis Act, the Butch Lewis Act that was also passed out of the House uh, that talk, talks about this particular issue as well, protecting the pensions of people who work very hard for them. Uh, and moving along. Trust us, guys, we're making good progress. We've got uh, only four or five more issues, and then we're ready to, to talk about questions. And hopefully, by going through all of these, I've hopefully answered some of your questions so that we have the opportunity to, to you know, talk about the things that I might not have hit on. We're talking about education now. I'm a former chemistry teacher. Uh, I also spent four or five years running a nonprofit that focuses on early childhood literacy. There is really nothing more important than a good education. Uh, my dad was a refugee, and he taught me that the only thing that they can't take away from you is your education, you know, your brain. Um, so after teaching chemistry in 11th grade, I was really struck by one thing. Uh, I'm a white woman. I don't know if you've noticed, but I am. Um, and, and I taught in a community. My school at Simon Gratz was 97, 98% African American. And most of the teachers in my school were white women. Um, and so something obvious, you know, was striking, which is we can't be what we can't see. And so one of the things I introduced uh, in this year is the Teacher Diversity and Retention Act with a number of my colleagues, which basically says that we need to strengthen the recruitment, training, and retention of diverse candidates so that people, children, can see what, what, you know, what they could be um, when they go back. And so I also am a supporter of the Rebuild America School Act of 2019, which would invest $100 billion in public schools if that were to have the opportunity to get uh, through the Senate. And lastly, something that has gotten through the Senate, I was a supporter of the Future Act. And this reauthorizes funding for the historically black, black colleges, such as Lincoln University and other minority institutions. <laughs> Almost 
small business. Uh, so most folks in Congress are parts of two committees. I'm on Armed Services as we talk about, I'm on Foreign Affairs as we talk about, but I asked um, our leadership, our, uh, our uh, Mrs. Speaker Pelosi, if I could be on three. Um, I'm on small business as well because I think it's really important that we elevate the small and mid-sized businesses in our, our community and I have some experience in this area. And so in the small business area, one thing that we, um, that I have been an advocate for and that I'm hoping to see bundled in another set of, of bills is bipartisan legislation that requires the federal government to pay small businesses net 15 instead of net 30. And for those of you guys who are in the business world, that basically means that you're getting paid more quickly. Uh, and that means that you are able to maybe grow your business or keep alive in your business. When I was doing business uh, at the school district in Philadelphia and with Title I money, I can tell you that net 15 or net 30 was a fantasy. It was largely net you know, six months, net nine, nine months. And so there was really no way to keep alive as a business if you weren't having access to cash flow. And so this is one of the things I'm working on to make sure we get through. I was also able to invite a member of our community, Mr. Bill Scalish, to join me in DC to testify in front of my small business committee about the impact of harmful tariffs on his business. He was a countertop cabinet maker, amongst other things, and was really being hurt. And in fact, I should check in on him to see about what ended up happening. I was worried that he was going to go out of business as a result of the you know, kind of chaos that was going on with the China tariffs. And lastly, I also authored a Small Business Transparency Act, which was enacted into law in 2019. Previously, small and mid-sized businesses who were competing with fe for federal money, for federal contracts, just basically wouldn't get them and would be basically be left in the dark as to why they didn't. This law uh, tells the federal government that if a small and mid-sized business uh, competes for a contract and doesn't get it, that they're required, the government is required to tell them why, so that they can learn from the, the response of the government and hopefully do more the next time. And finally, as we leave this area, something that's really special and, and important to me is corporate social responsibility, making sure that when you're a for-profit business that you're not only uh, addressing your shareholders, uh, the importance of your shareholders, but you're also considering people and planet in that conversation. So I was able to chair in the full committee a committee hearing on corporate social responsibility, again, having the opportunity to elevate that conversation at a national level. Next slide. Okay, everybody take a breath because we're hitting the one that everybody wants to talk about. <laughs> Impeachment um, was also something, is also something that uh, is going on, of course, in Congress right now. Uh, and we talked at the very beginning about the importance that, uh, of the oath of office, and I take my oath very, very seriously, I've taken it many times. Um, and so, thank you. Um, and so, I, amongst uh, a number of people, were very, very reticent to move forward on. Uh, impeachment investigations for a lot of different reasons. Our country is damaged, as you've hopefully heard throughout the conversation. My mission is to heal the country and our nation and our community as well. And right in the beginning, I felt as though what was going on would only hurt the country even more. Uh, but when the Ukraine situation and investigation came up, I and six other members of the freshman class, all of whom had served in the military or, the, or intelligence communities in the past, really felt like that this was a different animal. And that we were stepping with a current sitting president in a future election using taxpayer dollars to harm an ally of ours, to advance the, um, to get dirt on a political opponent. Those, that was just the perfect storm of unaccepted uh, behavior. And so I, I <laughs> Uh, 
um, and also what we do from a diplomatic effort. I'm the only Pennsylvanian who serves on the Armed Services Committee on both sides of the aisle. So Pennsylvania is number nine in the country in terms of defense appropriations. That's how important our community is to the, the national picture. And so a few things that I would like to highlight that went on this year through the, what's called the NDAA, or the National Defense Appropriations Act. One thing that I was able to push forward is a bipartisan Securing America's Rare Earths Supply Act. Now follow me here because I'm kind of a geek about chemistry. Um, but China is largely controlling the supply of rare earth um, elements in our world right now. And that's really, really dangerous because we need those things. We need them for cell phones, we need them for satellites, we need them for pretty much everything as we become an, a, a world that is driven by computers. And so the uh, America's Rare Earth Supply Act was part of the NDAA and is now part of law to make sure that we're really understanding where these supplies are coming from and that we're not beholden to China, amongst other places, uh, for those supplies, um, I, so, uh, for those uh, elements. I also founded uh, the first ever bipartisan caucus, which supports women in the military. Women are now about 20% of the military. We're going to increasingly become more and more, as much as 30% in the next decade, and hopefully 51%, because that's what part of the population we are. Um, and so I'm hoping that by creating this bipartisan caucus of more, of more than 50 members of Congress, that we can talk about the trajectory of women as they serve, when they get recruited, when they're active duty, when they become reservists, when they uh, become veterans, making sure that that's a whole arc of how we're treating women because they're increasingly more and more important in our military and, need, and deserve to be treated with uh, the same respect that the men are. I, thank you. I also founded, co-founded something called Four Country, and this is going to be important for those of you guys who are trying to listen to the bipartisan conversation. Four Country is a caucus that is nine Democrats and nine Republicans, all who have served in the military in the past. And what's cool about this caucus is that all the other caucuses um, are, are related to a specific issue. You've heard me talk maybe about L the LGBT caucus that I'm part of, or one that's about the environment, or one that's about um, the wine caucus. There is actually one of those. Um, but, but this particular caucus is actually uh, the only one of its kind that I'm aware of. It's not ideological. It's not about one issue at all. It's about how do we come together as people who have served, who have taken that oath, to try and find our common ground. And this is a caucus that's just new. We meet every other week. And I think we've made some good progress, and I'll share the next slide to tell you what, what that progress is. The last slide before we move on to uh, the future. As a result of a lot of work on the behalf of this office, uh, this congressional office, as well as uh, standing on the shoulders of a lot of other members of Congress who have been working on this issue for a very, very long time, we were able to secure funding at for uh, federal parental leave, 12 weeks of federal parental leave for 2.1 million people. This is something that's been worked on, as I mentioned, for a very, very long time. And for some folks, it's not enough, right? I understand, because we want not just parental leave, we want family leave. We don't want it just for federal employees, we want it for everyone. But please understand that this is a, this is a big step. And this big step happened uh, for a lot of different reasons. It happened because it went through the NDAA, which is the defense bill. It happened because it was bipartisanly pushed for by the Four Country Caucus. It also happened because Ivanka Trump supported it. So we ended up being able to kind of pull something off that I think is pretty special as a result of working across the aisle. So that's where we'll end the conversation. And that's before we head into questions, um, just a little bit of a glimpse into the future. You know, what will we be looking at in the next year? Um, some of the three things that I'd like to highlight are the following. Uh, one is this four country caucus that I'm working on and with. We're going to be putting forward some legislation very, very shortly that's about the importance of national service. It's not mandatory to, to do na national service, nor should it be, but I think it's really, really important. And I think part of our problems as a nation right now is that we don't see each other in places like this. You know, we don't, we don't collide with each other as molecules will. And we need to make sure through, you know, uh, Programs like the military, programs like Teach for America, which I've participated in, or City Year, or Peace Corps, or any number of those service programs, that kids and, frankly, uh, adults have the opportunity to collide with each other, uh, and programs that incentivize them to do so. And so I'm going to be putting forward some legislation with Representative Mike Waltz, uh, who's a former Army guy, uh, new, newly elected congressman, uh, and we're going to be putting that forward, hopefully, to incentivize more people to participate in national service. And this is not, again, a new idea, but hopefully now with so many new people in Congress, we'll have an opportunity to gain some traction on that. 
I'm also going to be putting forward legislation about literacy. Um, literacy is really important to uh, securing a good education. You'll be seeing that dropped as well. And finally, at a national level, not related to my office, I hope that you might be seeing some movement on infrastructure. Um, and I don't, please don't hold me to this, but there's definitely enough mumbling going on that maybe we'll see something coming out of uh, Congress shortly on that too. And so that's a preview into the uh, future. Can I get a time check? Is that what I'm supposed to be at? I think I'm, okay, 742. Uh, we're gonna now transition into the question part. Um, if you have any questions, please write them down on your piece of paper. Please make sure that it's legible. A lot of times we have a really hard time reading. And please make sure that you also have all your contact information. So if for some reason we're not able to get to your question, I've got my, my team uh, committed to, and I follow up on making sure that you get an answer from us. Um, the mayor will be taking those questions and sorting them, trying to make sure that if there's seven questions on one issue that we don't ans answer it seven times, uh, and we will answer as many questions as we are able to uh, in the time that we have. Thanks. do our very best uh, to help Chrissy get to all of these questions, um, or at least the spirit of your question. Let's start with a really easy one for you, and then we'll work our way through. We've got some really, some really good ones on here. Um, how do you decide what to, uh, when to co-sponsor a bill? That's a great question. Um, that's a very, very good question. As I mentioned, there are about 7,000 bills that come through a Congress every two years, and every two years it starts over again. Um, so anything that didn't get through sometimes gets reintroduced, sometimes never happens again. Uh, and so there's a lot of different ways that I decide what to co-sponsor. One is you know, what's coming from our community. What do people think is important? Uh, advocacy, um, lobbying is a really important thing to come to our office and let us know. I tell people who come to our office either in Washington or here in the district, uh, so if you see something, say something. We're a tiny little team, um, and we are a new team. So if there's something that's important to you, let us know what it is. We'll take a look at it. Um, we're committed to transparency. We're committed to an open door policy. We're committed to telling you what it is that we're deciding to do, why we've decided to do it. Sometimes an issue will have multiple bills on it. So carbon pricing is an example. Um, and so we'll take a look at all of the different um, things that are out there, solutions that are out there, and try and figure out which one has the most opportunity, the most traction, and part of that cal calculus is where did it come from? Does it come from the Committee of Jurisdiction? Does it have bipartisan support? You know, those are the kinds of things that we're trying to think about when we decide whether or not to put a name on a bill. Uh, and it really is an important step to put your name on a bill. I don't want to be that person who's known for being on the most bills. That doesn't mean anything if your name is on the most bills. I want to make sure that they're on meaningful bills. Is there any legislative efforts underway to address campaign finance? Yes, yes. So the, ver so the way that Congress works every two years, you start over again, as I mentioned, and people set aside the first 10 numbers or so for meaningful legislation. So anything that you see with a low number, like HR1, HR3, HR8, those are meaningful pieces of legislation that are deliberately, those numbers have been saved for a purpose. Um, so HR8 is an example was the gun, the, the background check one. And that actually was named 8 because it was the 8th anniversary of Gabby Giffords um, being shot. Um, HR3 was the one we talked about, which was the prescription drug bill, because that was a promise that all of us made as, as freshman candidates that we would address that. HR1, the very first bill that we pushed forward and that we voted for was about campaign finance reform, amongst other things, but about kind of Citizens United issues, it was about ethics in government, it was about access to the ballot, it was a huge bill full of all kinds of stuff. 
Um, and it was the very first bill that we passed. Now this is back to the conversation of the fact that it's a huge and beautiful bill that was largely partisan. I think only one or two Republicans voted for that. And that's not super helpful. You know, we need to make sure that we're taking those parts of the bill that should be pushed forward and that do make sense that we can all get behind to ask for change. Um, this is a, a broken system. It's a deeply broken system. The fact that I and my colleagues are running all the time, raising resources all the time, uh, is really, really broken. And so this is something that I'm very hopeful that we'll continue to be able to push forward on. Some of those pieces of HR 1 that have to do with campaign finance, some of them that have to do with access to the ballot, some of them that have to do with um, ethics um, are being broken into smaller pieces and are being pushed forward. What my understanding as a freshman is, is that the back half of the, of the second year of every Congress, that's when people get to work. You know, they, they kind of get it out of their, their system, all of the things, the beautiful legislation, and then they kind of are supposed to sit down and get and roll up their sleeves and get to work. I don't know what that would mean in this particular environment, um, because we are not only in a presidential year, but we're also involved in the impeachment process, so we'll have to see what people are willing to do. What I can tell you is that on the very day that the articles of impeachment were moved forward, we also moved the USMCA forward. So we are working all the time. <coughs> Is there a way to fix student loan debt? Ugh, that's a hard one. Um, I, I um, believe that the government is, should invest in the people, um, and I believe that education is an investment rather than an expense. I believe that the government shouldn't be making money in, in ways off the people, but so I believe that we ought to be consolidating debt, lowering interest rates. I am supportive of a bunch of legislation that is trying to figure out, I'll give you the example of me. I'm an engineer, I went to school on an ROTC scholarship. When I went on an ROTC scholarship, it was mandated that I had to major in industrial engineering um, because that's what the needs of the people were. Uh, we need to do a little bit more of that. We need to think about what are the needs of the people. The needs of the people are rural medicine, the needs of the people are, we have a, a problem with um, uh, helping young children with it, mental health issues because it's more attractive to work for older, you know, in their older communities and more lucrative. There's a lot of places where the economy isn't meeting the demands. And so the way that the federal government can be helpful in that is to incentivize people to pursue careers and things that we need. Um, and that's one of the, the several different bills that I am supportive of are about that particular issue and those particular jobs that are most uh, critical in our community. relationship with other democracies throughout the world and do you feel how could we best heal these relationships? I am worried about our um, alliances. I am uh, have there in Congress you have the opportunity sometimes to go on what's called a CODAL. It's a congressional delegation. You have the opportunity to go on behalf of the American people in your community. I had the opportunity to go on a CODAL to Normandy to celebrate the and, and commemorate the 75th anniversary of D-Day. Um, and I was really struck, uh, having never been there, um, by the importance of our alliances. And um, they were really overwhelmed by the fact that it was the largest congressional delegation ever to go uh, to anything. <laughs> there were 70 or so of us who were there. Uh, and I do worry that we are, are worrying our allies uh, and that we are destroying really important relationships. That's one of the things that we have uniquely is great, strong alliances world. And so I'm trying to remember, Peter, where, what the question was. What, where, what would you like me to comment on? Is Just to uh, feel our relationship with foreign democracies. Yes. Yeah. yeah, and that's why I do think it's really important to, to the second trip that I was able to go on was uh, I went to Afghanistan, to Turkey, and to Jordan, and I happened to be there and ran back home the day that we, um, that the Turkish invasion happened. So I had just spent the seven days in, in the theater uh, talking to people, State Department, CIA, FBI, uh, the State Department and uh, military of the places that I was visiting. Every last one of them, we've asked them this, like, what keeps you up at night question, and the answer from almost every last one of them was, well, we're really worried about the Turks coming over and the Kurds, and we're really worried about that. And no sooner had our wheels gone on the ground than the, we were met with the announcement of, of the President's decision to withdraw. And that's very worrisome. It's, it's worrisome not only for our relationship with the Kurds. I happen to be traveling with Jason Crow. If you're watching your TV tonight, you'll see him as uh, one of the impeachment managers. Jason Crow's an Army Ranger. He served with the Kurds. You know, we landed 
he was on my Kodal, we landed to, to hear that news and he was devastated, you know, these are allies uh, and they depended on us they, and we, we owe them. Um, and not only is it the worry that I have about the Kurds, but the message that we send to every other ally that we have, you know, is, is our word good? Um, and so I am worried about where we stand World stage, and that's partially why I'm grateful to be on Foreign Affairs and Armed Services, and that's a lot of why I'm here in Congress. Where do you stand on nonviolent drug offenses and the recategorization of marijuana as a Schedule I drug? Uh, <laughs> I, I believe that, I, I think we're now at 40 states or so where marijuana is legal. I think we are not one of those states as far as I understand it. I do believe that medical marijuana is legal here. Um, I, I believe that this is a social kind of justice issue as much as it is anything when we're talking about some of these issues. When I was teaching at Gratz, a lot of my kids would regularly get, you know, swept up in uh, problems with small amounts of marijuana. That's, that's concerning to me. I think people should be treated equally and fairly on this particular issue. By the way, I, where I stand on this particular issue is largely that it's with the state. Um, I think it's heading, in, as you can probably see, with 40 out of 50 states, it's probably heading that Pennsylvania will make marijuana legal. Um, but I do believe it's part of the state's responsibility to think about. I was a supporter and did vote for, and it has passed all the way through the Senate, um, banking of marijuana sales because it's a problem when you're developing an industry and you have free, uh, open cash, basically, and not a way to, to finance or, or track it. And that, I believe, was passed uh, and signed by the president recently, too. Do you see the debt deficit as an issue, and how would you work to resolve it? issue, um, and that's part of this new DEM coalition is about uh, responsible governance and responsible spending. You know, I'm new on this job, so I'm still trying to navigate all of the levers that we can pull to be more responsible with the way that we run our government. Um, but that's part of that group that I'm part of, is to think about how to be responsible uh, business uh, leaders of our, of our government. Um, there's also another group that I have not uh, joined that's called the Blue Dogs that I've been taking at too, that's a much, uh, even more conservative, uh, fiscally conservative group of people. But I wanted to share with you guys because I think a lot of the media, the press, talks a lot about um, the far right, the far left. There really is a strong middle. Uh, and as I mentioned, 105 of this Democratic class are part of that strong middle that you never hear about. Um, and that we're working really, really hard for responsible government and responsible spending of our taxpayer dollars. Uh, and you just don't hear about it because we're not tweeting at people and poking at people. Um, and it would be, I really want to tell you that people like me are more than people that, that are more provocative, much, much more. What hope can you give to a single mom who makes too much to qualify for assistance, but fears that she will not be able to afford her rent in Phoenixville or buy a house? So this is an excellent question, and we actually just had, before I came here, we had a round table on affordable housing, that very issue of not only affordable housing, but we were combining it with a conversation about accessible transportation to affordable housing. Um, and so one of the bigger problems here in Chester County, uh, expensive places like Chester County, is we do have uh, a lot of job opportunities, but we don't have a lot of folks who can get to the job opportunities because they're limited by transportation or they're limited by affordable housing, so that they're not living within striking distance of those jobs that they, that they need access to. So we did, we just spent the whole afternoon talking about this, touring affordable housing in Phoenixville, talking about the success stories of what's been going on to, for many of the people who we talked to were single, uh, single moms in one of the particular areas. It's a problem, you know, it's, it's, it's an absolute problem and we need to be addressing it in the ways that Phoenixville is, in the ways that our state uh, is looking at it. I'm personally a co-sponsor of several different bills that are talking about this particular issue uh, at, a, at a national level. One of them talks about specifically creating um, incentives for people to build uh, affordable housing near transportation hubs so that you are coupling those things together. Another thing I was talking to a gentleman uh, earlier about was this very issue of what do you do when people are just barely getting by? You know, we do a lot of things to make sure that people don't fall between the cracks, but there are a lot of people who are just barely getting by. Financial literacy is another thing that, that we've been focused on in our office. So when we talk about literacy, it's not just literacy in the traditional sense, it's also numeracy. You have the skills that you need to be able to do 
the math to be a tradesperson or, or whatever, um, and also finally financial literacy, and I think that that's also something that we've been advocating for in the small business area as well. Uh, I hope that's a helpful conversation, but it is very, very important, particularly in places like here where we're, it's expensive, very, very expensive to live here and people are being pushed out. I'm combining two of them okay. together. So um, can you uh, talk a little bit about why did you impeach Trump when you know that he is going to be acquitted? And do you feel that this is more of a political exercise rather than something that would rise to the level of impeachment? So um, I feel as though it's my responsibility to uphold my oath of office, to protect the democracy, uh, to declare that this is not okay. And I believe... have consequences, but when we're playing with future elections and not giving people their full opportunity, that's where I draw the line, and that's where we ought to draw the line. And so that's why I stand where I stand, and also why I recognize in all likelihood this will end uh, without an impeachment, um, but I do believe it needed to be said that this shouldn't stand. And I do believe that, that's why I encourage you guys to go home and watch and to read. I do believe that the other part of this process is for us to learn what we don't know uh, and to ask for the witnesses and to ask for the documents and to you know, educate ourselves. And so when we do get the chance to take that oath, uh, we have good information. And I'll share with you, having been raised in a family, my dad Republican largely my whole childhood, my mom a Democrat, uh, they walked to the polls together, they voted together, they walked home, they canceled each other's votes every single time. Um, so I really respect the, you know, the, sacred, the sacred right of the vote, but I really felt as though this was the important uh, upholding of my own. What has been the most pleasant surprise for you in the last year? And what has been the biggest disappointment relative to your hopes? I would say that the biggest surprise for me was just how the quality of the people who were down in Washington working on our behalf. Um, I was just, just a regular human being, never considered running for anything. The last thing I ran for was in fifth grade, um, class secretary, and I did not win. Um, so I just had this perception of what Washington is like. Um, I had this idea of who our elected representatives were. And I've been surprised um, to see that that's not, in fact, these people are really good people. They're real servants, uh, and they're working really, really hard. Now, they might be working at cross purposes, and that's what you elected them to do, right? You, you elected a representative to represent us, and those people may represent their community, they just not, might not represent our community. And so sometimes, it ends up with not much happening, but that's how the democracy is supposed to work. So I've been really, really surprised, pleasantly surprised by how many really good quality people are there and how hard they work. Uh, that's the other thing that I didn't understand is that when I'm standing here, um, I'm working. When I'm in DC, I'm working. You know, you may not see me or us, but we're all working very, very hard on all of our behalves. And I was struck by a headline that was in the New York Times last week, you know, Congress is on a four day weekend. I was like, hmm. um, it, uh, when you've got uh, Martin Luther King's holiday, most likely your congressperson is out there doing things for that holiday, you know, and working in the community. So that's been a surprise. A sad thing, um, it, you really wish that we could find compromise. You know, you really wish that we could get together and, and uh, find solutions and knock off the nastiness. I think one of the things that's been disappointing to me is seeing some of the folks who've been there for a half a minute and that sometimes you'll hear them things, say things like, well, they did that to us first. Um, and you're going, that's really not a reason why we should be you know, doing that to people. And, or you know, they started it. They sound like five-year-olds in some ways. Um, and so the good news is, yeah, um, the good news is there's a lot of us new people here. So we're working really hard to change that behavior so that it, and it comes from both sides of the aisle. We have a, a number of questions specifically around actions that will be taken to secure the election process in 2020. Yeah, um, 
so one of the work pieces of the, one of the parts of HR one had to do with election security, um, particularly some of the social media stuff. I think was really important in that area. What I discovered, and this talks to, uh, to partisanship, is um, I'm on foreign affairs. There was a bill that was put forward on foreign affairs that talked about election security and that talked about you know protecting our, our election. And in bills, you have kind of a preamble. You have a part of like why you're doing this, right? And the preamble it tells about why you're doing it, and then the part of the of the bill says, and so this is what we're doing, you know, to protect the election, to protect the ballot. The preamble part was very partisan, and it talked about the 2016 election. And so the Republicans on my committee weren't able to get behind that because for them it was beyond the pale. And so we fought, um, the young folks, the new folks fought to try to strike that part so that we could just stop it, you know, and stop. Could we just say 19, since 1945 we've had problems, since 1776 we've had problems, you know, we don't have to say uh, 2016. But that wasn't possible in this, you know, kind of partisan place. And so I am hopeful that we'll continue, like some of, the some of the freshmen are trying to push on leadership to maybe get new leadership, you know, to make sure that we, we have the opportunity to, to move some of that stuff forward. <laughs> what I tend to say disappointingly is I don't think a whole lot has happened, uh, particularly at the Senate, with any of these issues. Um, I, would, I, would, I forgot to share this with you. All of these things that we talked about, all the beautiful things that we talked about, we, the Congress, the House of Representatives, we've passed about 400 bills so far. Um, in the work that we've been doing. About 275 of them are bipartisan. About 70 of them have actually seen the light of day in the Senate and gone to the President's desk for signature. So it's not because we're not productive, it's not because we're not working across the aisle. We really need to be working to try to get these things out of the Senate and onto the President's desk. And I need to help for that. And in relation to that, one of the questions was, what can we do to help break that logjam of bills? In this A bunch Senate? of things. One is call your senators, both of them. Um, uh, don't try calling other people's senators, it won't work. Um, and the other thing is vote, um, you know, be active. And when I, was, when I was growing up, my dad and my mom would say, I don't care who you vote for, just vote. Um, and I think that that's also something With impeachment being the hot topic, what are you doing to refocus our nation on topics like gun control and immigration? As a student, I see the effects of these issues on my peers. So what I'm trying to do is constantly bring the conversation back to, to these issues that we've been talking about, and I try to do that in a lot of different ways. One is to try to be accessible in our community, uh, to try and talk about the things that are of substance as we have over the last hour or so. The other thing I try to do is I take advantage when I'm asked to have conversations on, on in the media. I really try hard to accept offers and opportunities to talk about real issues. And another thing that I have been surprised by as a neophyte in, in, in government is that anytime you see a member on, on television, most likely that member has been asked to show up to talk about something like, for instance, family leave uh, or, or parental leave. And most likely they're showing up to talk about something they'd like to talk about, but inevitably they'll be asked about impeachment or whatever the you know, flavor of the day is. And so we're trying to break through. You know, we're trying to send those messages about what we're for and what we're working on. And so I'll keep taking the opportunity to talk because I think it has the opportunity to, to tell our community what's happening, our commonwealth what's happening, our country what's happening. And I'm back to work. I'm doing this work now. What key environmental work can be accomplished with the current Congress? And there was a concern around uh, specifically materials, perhaps even from your own office, that were not recyclable. Huh. Interesting. We will take a look at that. We try pretty hard to be environmentally responsible. In fact, I was just looking at that in the office today. We have all kinds of different buckets uh, for things. So I'll take a look at our, our environmental responsibility you know, footprint. In some ways, we're a little restricted because we have to buy through certain vendors, and so I don't know that we always have the greatest opportunities to be as responsible as we need to be. But I fully take that on as a responsible and action item to take a look at our own business practices. Uh, what else was the question? Oh, oh, well, specifically, what key environmental work can be accomplished with the current Congress? Um, I 
think the conversation has to be about why this is good for business. You know, I think the conversation has to be about um, what we can do to uh, to make our world more efficient, you know, uh, in our businesses and in our buildings. I think there is a lot that we can do. We also have to have conversations and dance around words a little bit. We're all talking about the same thing, we just may use different language when we're talking about it. And so being thoughtful on how we're communicating and also embracing a conversation uh, and not condemning is really, really important. As I mentioned, I sit on the Foreign Affairs Committee. There's a lot of Republicans there, uh, to my left when I look up. Um, and when they talk about issues of climate, they just use different words. Um, and they're, and I've actually been like really surprised. I think that when you see the, the bill that came out of the uh, NDAA with $750 billion worth of taxpayer money paying for the defense uh, of the nation, much, much of that was in greening the DOD. And it took a bipartisan effort to get that through the House and the Senate and to the President's desk for signature. So there is motion. Now that Virginia has passed the Equal Rights Act, what can be done to overcome the obstacles to passage? I will, I will plead ignorance on that one because I actually had a, a note to myself to try and figure out what's next. I know that there's a bill, Carolyn Maloney, who's a representative from New York, has been pushing for uh, kind of the reinvigoration um, of the ERA. I know that it's expired effectively, I believe, in the 80s. Um, and so I don't really know what happens next now that we've hit all of the states that we need to hit, but that the, at the national level it's kind of obsolete. I don't know, and I'll, I'll take a look at it. I think importantly the ERA and is really important, but we also need to make sure we're respecting all people of all forms. Uh, and we as a nation in the last 30 or 40 years have moved to define that more broadly as well. Rare earth elements in China. I thought all, many, most of the rare earth elements were found or mined or controlled by China. Is that true? Sort of. Um, there are many rare earth elements, and what's interesting is they are not rare. Um, they just <laughs> come from you know, the bottom part of the periodic table. If you go home and take a look at it from the bottom row, uh, that's what you're talking about. Um, not all of them come from China. Not all of them are mined in China. They can be mined anywhere. In fact, the U.S. has a lot of uh, rare earth element opportunities, but the mining is very dirty. It's a very environmentally unfriendly uh, process. And so what's happened largely is China has, you know, not only cornered the market on some of the um, mining of it and processing of it, but they also are stockpiling it and, and buying it up. Um, and so this is the, the concern. And it's not just China, China it's Iran. Um, it's Korea. I mean, it's it's uh, a bunch of different places that we should be concerned about, and um, we just have had our eye off the ball on this particular issue, and we need to put it back on. Um, actually, I'll, I'll I'll add to that. Um, I get the opportunity on the Armed Services Committee to serve on what's called the Emerging Threats Subcommittee, and it talks about like what is it that you know what you should be scared of, um, and so I'm really excited to think about issues like. Um, security of rare earth elements, also AI, you know, artificial intelligence, also cybersecurity, also biosecurity. You see that there's a new um, possible uh, SARS-ish type uh, disease that's, that's circulating. So I'm really happy to be able to think about those very terrifying issues um, because somebody has to. What is being done about racial justice, specifically racial profiling, uh, specifically racial profiling, arrests, a school-to-prison pipeline, and disproportionate inca uh, incarceration of African Americans, and the difficulty of those who have been incarcerated to get jobs. What's the question? So the question is, uh, how for those who have been incarcerated and their difficulty to get jobs, what can be done around that issue? And also um, specifically around racial profiling and yeah, this is a, an important issue. Um, social justice is uh, a very important issue, and we haven't seen a whole lot of action in the Congress in the last couple of years on this. I think we were actually making some good bipartisan progress on this uh, several years ago uh, in terms of prison reform. It has been the conversation of a lot of our can of candidates for president. Our president, President Trump, has actually passed some legislation on this particular issue. Um, some of the things that we've been seeing in our communities uh, and as we tour around that are working are our vocational programs that are addressing uh, people as they're coming out of uh, being in prison and, and giving them fresh and clean starts. 
Uh, there's a lot of work that needs to be done in this area, and I would like to be more engaged in this area. Uh, I just have been kind of getting my legs under me this year and will take a much more active role on this particular topic in the next years to come, hopefully years. So much of our future depends on what we teach our kids now. This is, I think, our last question. Yep, sorry, the last one. How can we better prepare them to tackle our future challenges, such as climate change, and how can we increase women and people of diverse backgrounds in STEM-related fields? So next week, stay tuned, because I'm going to be starting yet another group that's the Women in STEM and STEAM Caucus. Uh, and as you probably know or don't know, there are only two women in Congress who have STEM and STEAM backgrounds, and we are joining forces to make sure that we're talking about this particular issue. Um, and the answer to this question and all questions is education, um, making sure that everyone has access to quality, excellent education, and that everybody has the same access to quality, excellent education. Uh, and that's why I try really hard to, to um, have this, if you can't be what you can't see, emphasis on, on, on things. Um, so I will continue to advocate for that. I think if it's okay with you guys, I will conclude so that you all can go home and watch the impeachment hearings. <laughs> and so if it's okay with you, I'd like to read a final statement. I'm sorry that I actually missed a little portion of what I wanted to talk to you um, about one of our greatest stories, but I will skip that for now and I will conclude if it's okay with you. And for those, for uh, Audrey, who I think is up there, can you show the quilt? Can we do? Okay. Then I will, I will go ahead and back up a little bit. Um, okay, so I'll start with what I wasn't able to, fit to finish. So it's been 100, uh, one year and 20 days, and I'm very, very glad and grateful to be able to stand in front of you and say, I believe that the congressional district, the 6th congressional district is strong, and so the state of our, our district is strong. We recognize and embrace the diversity of our community. Our diversity is our strength. And I'm very proud, as I'm sure you are, of our growing businesses and our economic strength. We are one of only two counties here in Chester County that is growing in the state of Pennsylvania. And I'm so proud of our strong agricultural tradition. And we embrace, as we always have, the stewardship and importance of our open spaces and natural resources. And we are very, very proud of our shared pursuit of excellence in education. And in fact, this is the, the, step, the, the future of our economy is very strong. And it's an awesome, awesome responsibility to serve you in Congress, to protect and foster our community, the Commonwealth, and, the country, and our country. But there is work to be done, and this is where I actually would like to back up and show this picture. And I rem I'm reminded all the time of this work that we're doing when we think of Corey. And I first met Corey on a visit to Berks Technical Institute. He was attending classes there to earn his associate's degree in business administration. Having served our country in the Army, he was working as hard as he could to achieve his next goal and to transition from his military service to his civilian life. And it appeared that he was doing all the right things. Getting his degree, working in an internship, building a network, hanging out with his support dog, Stella. But it really wasn't enough, and life presented Corey with a lot of challenges, and the safety nets that we provided weren't nimble enough to adapt very quickly to his situation. So despite his best efforts and the best efforts of our office, hard times followed. Corey didn't give up, and neither did we. And after 132 days of working with Corey and a great many obstacles, he is now able to relaunch his life. He will have his own residence, transportation, and he'll be able to bring his support dog back to his side. And the ideals Corey has fought for, for us, and hoped for, for himself, have finally become his reality. So the work that we do here in this office and that my team does for our community goes far behind, beyond these legislative fixes that we spent a lot of time talking about and the bureaucratic problem solving. It is the work that I sincerely ask you all, my community, to help with. Our national dialogue is so fractured and far too many of us have broken into disparate silos. We've dug in deep to our ideological trenches with very little room for empathy or agreement or patience for differing opinions. I ask you all tonight to help, to be more understanding with one another, to share your stories, to recognize our mutual goals and interests, and to stop shouting across the valley at one another and to start recognizing the common ground we have. Patriotism and the ideological pursuit of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness belong to all of us. I ran for office pledging to work with our community at home and my colleagues in Washington, D.C. with civility and decency, and I'm really grateful that I hope that we as a community 
are, be, are behaving in that same way. And I'll conclude with the last picture, sharing you a picture of something that's in my office and an experience that happened last month. December 14th was the eighth anniversary of the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School in Newtown, Connecticut. My husband's cousin, Peter Houlihan, was actually an EMT at the scene in Newtown Square, in Newtown. The Chester County chapter of Moms Demand Action invited me to speak at a vigil commemorating that terrible, tragic day, along with my friend who, meant, who I've mentioned, Michelle Roberson. And after sharing my thoughts, I left and I went to the next engagement on my calendar. And again, I thought to myself, there's really work to be done. But the other prevailing thought that I had because of this somber anniversary is, tomorrow really isn't promised to any of us. Each of us has this day and this moment to build upon. How do we use it for ourselves and for our families, for our community, for our more perfect union? I think of our district and our Commonwealth's unique history. For those of you who have visited us in Washington, D.C., you may have seen this quilt of stars hung upon the wall of the office at 1218 Longworth. Please visit. We are that quilt. We are stitched together for common purpose, and at times the fabric may be frayed and the stitches may be strained, but it can be repaired with intention, with planning, and with hard work. As you know, I'm a third-generation veteran, and I'm the daughter of a refugee, and the call to service runs very deep in my family, and my gratitude for this nation has to, all this nation has to offer runs very deep as well. I believe there is always work to be done, and we as individuals and as a collective have to challenge ourselves to give back, always, and to be committed to work towards our highest and best use. Abraham Lincoln famously said, we are not enemies, but friends. We must not be enemies. Though passion may have strained, it must not break our bonds of affection. The mystic cords of memory stretching from every battlefield and patriot grave to every living heart and hearthstone all over this broad land will yet swell the chorus of the Union, when again touched, as surely they will be, by the better angels of our nature. Please know that every day it is my intention to stitch together the bonds of our affection. It is the honor and it is the privilege of a lifetime to be your representative, and I thank you for your sharing your evening with me tonight.